How about we get this party started? All right, uh, welcome everybody to the Grit City Think and Drink. Uh, I'm glad you all chimed in tonight. It always, uh, I, you know, I appreciate you coming. Um, I know that the weather outside is getting marginal. Um, so um, I recognize that uh, this will be an awesome place for you to come and spend some time every, uh, usually, every second Tuesday of the month. Um, so this is a special one because our speaker tonight was actually Illin uh, back in, was that was August, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. Was so luckily fun. he's feeling all better and he's given an extra, uh, an extra Grit City Think and Drink for us in September. <coughs> but the next one is October 13th. And uh, Shannon Seidel is gonna give a talk from PLU. She's gonna talk about um, education in STEM or um, science, technology, engineering and mathematics. So I hope you all will chime in to hear what she has to say. Um, and we have our um, speakers lined up for the rest of the year. And so you are in September now. We are now looking for speakers for 2021. So if you have ideas, if you are interested, if you have some people you know that you think would make a cool talk for this series, uh, why don't you text that to me, or sorry, chat that to me sometime during today and I'll start putting some lists together and inviting people for next year. Um, it's always fun. The nice thing, uh, if there is, about being virtual in the COVID world is that we can invite anybody because they don't have to come to um, do it in person. So if you have some people in other parts of the country or other parts of the world, um, we can actually bring them in as long as they don't have to stay up too late to come give a talk on our time zone. So um, let me know if you have some ideas and I'd be happy to hear them. So a uh, couple things. One, as you can see down in our left-hand corner, um, we have for a long time been sponsored by the Swiss uh, restaurant and pub, which is uh, a mere hundred yards from my office at UW Tacoma. Um, they were here when I started at UW Tacoma in 1999 and well before that. Um, they've always been a big part of us. Um, they've always taken us in when we show up and we've had so many events there. And unfortunately, I don't know if you have seen that, but the Swiss has decided, unfortunately, that they have to close. Um, so they are at this point actually selling off everything. There's an auction. So if you wanna support them, you can go to the auction site. I'll find that link at some point, or Jim, if you have it, if you wanna put it in the chat. Um, it would be great if you um, done stuff at the Swiss and you want some memorabilia from there. Um, definitely support them, but we're, they are sorely missed and Jack and Carol Ann, who have known for quite a while, um, really going to miss those guys over there. Um, so this is in their honor again tonight, even though we are virtual. Um, we are going to be looking for, once we are non-virtual, um, looking for a new place to host this in person when we get to have beers um, right next to each other. Um, so if you have ideas for that, let me know. We're looking for definitely keeping it in the Grit City. So somewhere in the, somewhere in the near downtown area. So if you have ideas um, or you happen to be connected, let me know. But again, um, a big toast for those of you who are drinking out there, a big toast to the Swiss and to Jack and everybody over there. Um, hope that they find better roads uh, coming down the pipe. So. All right, so um, the way, for those of you who are new to Grit City Think and Drink, the way this works is that we will have an amazing talk by our, our speaker tonight, uh, Jim Thatcher, who I'll introduce uh, momentarily. We will then have a quick giveaway. Um, so we have some swag. Um, so normally we do raffle tickets, but um, these are Grit City Think and Drink socks. If you have not gotten a pair of these, these are a hot commodity. There is nothing cooler than wearing these babies, um, whether you are virtual or in real life. So um, we'll give away a couple pairs of those um, and I'm super happy to do that. And then we will have a uh, question and answer session uh, with our speaker where you can try to stump the speaker. 
um, you don't win anything except for uh, sort of that sense of accomplishment that goes along with it. So um, hopefully um, at that point, you'll use the chat function. For those of you, I'm assuming you're familiar with this by this point in the pandemic. Um, but just chat your questions later on, um, and I will have a cat who will also participate in tonight's lecture. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker. Uh, where are you? Dr. Jim Thatcher is an associate professor of urban studies at the University of Washington Tacoma and an affiliate with the Graduate School of Geography at the UW in Seattle. Uh, often referred to as critical data studies or digital political ecologies. His work examines the recursive relations among extremely large geospatial data sets. Uh, the, create, uh, where I lost it. the creation and analysis of the data sets and society uh, with a focus on how data has come to create, shape, and sustain modern urban environments. He is the lead editor of a 2018 University of Nebraska Press book on the roles of big data, has come to play within and across academic geography, and his second book on resistance to the power of data in our daily lives will be published in 2021 with Pluto Press. Congratulations. Uh, and if you didn't know, he is an acclaimed banjo player uh, with so many credits to his name. So if you want to find out more about that, um, definitely hit him up, hit up the internet and find out more about his accomplishments uh, with the banjo. But uh, without further ado, our speaker, Dr. Jim Thatcher. Woo. You're not going to find really much about me playing banjo on the internet. Um, but uh, you could find other stuff. Let me see if I'm, I'm going to start sharing my screen and get you some slides here. All right, let's get this full screen. Uh, you gonna get full screen? Come on. All right, I changed the title a little bit, but this is a joke because obviously it's sort of. Anyway, here's Wonderwall. Um, so here's the, the talk outline. Um, first, I'm just going to go over who I am because, you know, then you get a better sort of sense of where I'm coming from when I write these things and talk about these things. <clears throat> and I'll give a very brief history of gerrymandering. Um, I am not a legal scholar and a lot of how gerrymandering plays out is in legal court cases and I can run over them and, and but, um, you know, that doesn't seem like the most fun to have over beers. Um, then I'm going to make an argument that sort of all districts are gerrymandered. And then I'm going to show you some work that I've been doing with uh, some colleagues on uh, time, distance, travel, and sort of space in Ohio, which is a, uh, if you <coughs> believe or listen to the ACLU, a heavily ger gerrymandered state. Right, so look at that, it's a fuzzy picture of me. Um, you just got uh, all this, so I'll skip it, but it is important to say what I actually teach so you get a little background around me is sort of um, spatial data analysis and visualization and a lot of cartography. So in that top image, I have some students that built uh, for a class, they built one of those interactive AR sandboxes. And this is uh, when we all get to go back onto campus or ever wander into the urban studies building, that's just on the first floor and you can play with it. Um, and then on the bottom, you can see um, that's actually a dissimilarity matrix that is mapping District 7 in Washington, which we'll, we'll come back to at the end. So let's talk about gerrymandering in the US. Look at this lizard. That is a big lizard. Um, this is a kind of around uh, north of Boston, and it's from this guy. Oh, why is not showing up? It's from this guy. That is Eldrig Gary. Um, he was our fifth vice president, and he was the ninth governor of Massachusetts. And way, way back in 1812, he uh, and some friends drew some maps that looked very suspicious to the local media at the time. They didn't look like they were following any sort of known community. 
except that a community, except for a community that would keep his political party in power. <clears throat> um, newspapers thought this looked like a salamander, and boom, that is where we get the term gerrymander, uh, not gerrymander, unfortunately. Although if you ever do end up in Brockton, the Gary family farm is still operational there. For those of you who aren't from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, this is, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but this is basically where that looks in modern terms and Boston is kind of just south of it. So obviously that's a sort of odd design um, of, a, of a district. <clears throat> And now I need you to bear with me because there's going to be a bunch of walls of text, which aren't great when uh, we're all chilling in an evening, but it is what it is. So after that, it's mostly left up to the states. And some states actually adjust their representation and their districts as populations shift and grow, um, as they're supposed to do uh, every 10 years. Others don't. Tennessee flat out did not redraw redistricts from 1901 until 1961. At a certain point, um, and you know, that's not to just pick on one read, like, you know, one area and be like, oh, this is a problem there. That's not true. Like, for example, at one point in California, in their state legislature, uh, Los Angeles County had 420 or 422 times the um, uh, population of the smallest district and they had equal representation. And so Supreme Court cases began kind of, uh, cases challenging this start uh, hitting the Supreme Court in the 1960s. And so the first one that's sort of seen as a, as a landmark decision is Baker versus Carr. And that's basically just saying that state legislative redistricting plans are justiciable. And if anyone was paying attention last year, uh, justiciable and whether redistricting is or isn't is a, is a big deal. So that was decided then. Um, Gaffney versus Cummings, and I'm, I'm skipping some of these. These aren't all of the cases. I'm just highlighting some so that you get a kind of background sense of, of the history here. Gaffney versus Cummings is 1973. And that one is basically um, districts should have equal, uh, roughly equal populations when they're drawn. Um, and they, they give 10% as their kind of uh, rough estimation, although they particularly note that if you hit 10%, like that doesn't mean you're safe. They say that's not a safe harbor. That's just they should be at least that well or better. Um, and then we get um, uh, the Thornburg versus, uh, I think it's Jingles is how I've always heard it. But if uh, a lawyer wants to tell me I'm wrong, I, I would listen. Um, and that's 1986, and that's actually the big one uh, for people who care about um, racial gerrymandering. Um, because what that one decides is that that's, that's when majority minority districts can be required to make sure that if there's a high density population of a minority, their first choice can be elected sometimes. This is the big one in relation to the Voting Rights Act, uh, for example. So, um, so that happens in 86 and that continues. But uh, as you might remember from last year, which seems like an actual eternity ago, uh, partisan gerrymandering was a big deal. And partisan gerrymandering uh, kind of first prominently hits the courts in Gaffney versus Cummings, where they basically are just like, yes, partisan gerrymandering is a thing we can consider. And then in Davis versus Bandemer in 86 again, Notice we're seeing a bunch of things hitting in 86 regarding gerrymandering. Um, this is why uh, Sandra Day O'Connor's um, decisions later become so important. But partisan gerrymandering is bad. But basically in Benimer, they're like, well, you, you can't prove it. How do you, how do you like show it? And then in 2004, uh, Kennedy writes in dissent. So again, they're just basically like, we can't, we can't determine if there's partisan gerrymandering here or not. But Kennedy writes in dissent, like, you know, if you can meet these very, very, and he gives very specific criteria, then we can consider partisan gerrymandering. So, and this is actually a really noble kind of uh, sequence of events. Um, 
the uh, a few a while back the metric topology gerrymandering group, the MGGG uh, out of Tufts, it's Moon to Shins group. If you're familiar with um, gerrymandering, you might know that name. Uh, they are predominantly mathematicians, but some geographers and other, and other folks as well. They're like, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna come up with a metric that meets Kennedy's, uh, Kennedy's um, criteria. And they do it, and it's it's the, their their work is sort of on the efficiency gap, which I'm not going to really go into. But the case that comes before the court is, um, uh, and it, here's another moment where I want to pause and point out that gerrymandering isn't you know like one side does it and the other doesn't. Like that's not what's happening here. Um, even the case Rucho versus Common Cause, which is the big decision one was actually a combination of two cases. One was Rucho versus Common Cause, which is the uh, North Carolina districting maps. And the other was uh, Lamone versus Benesek, which was the uh, democratic uh, gerrymandering in Maryland, which was done by, if you remember, um, Tim Kaine, who you might remember from 2016, was a big was a that one. And uh, this time, as you also might remember, right before that case was decided, Kennedy stepped down. And so all of these people have been working for all of these years to develop this incredibly interesting, specific, nuanced, but like uh, a metric. <clears throat> and, and they had, and you can read their like um, amicus brief. It's really interesting because it's beautiful. Um, but Kennedy's not there, Gorsuch is. Lol, don't care. What's this metric even mean to me? And um, they decide that we conclude that partisan gerrymandering claims present political questions that are beyond the reach of the federal courts. That's uh, the um, Chief Justice John Roberts. He's basically saying partisan gerrymandering is not justiciable. That word comes back again. Um, <clears throat> this is unfortunate uh, from a lot of perspectives. It's also sort of uh, not unexpected in a lot of ways, because if you pinned all your hopes on persuading Justice Kennedy and Justice Kennedy is no longer there, well, you're rolling the dice <clears throat> and they didn't come up sevens. So how do you gerrymander? Again, I, I, I'm sorry for all of the text. I promise we're gonna get to lots of pictures soon. Um, the, the three main ways are cracking, packing, and stacking of which the two kind of most easy to see are cracking and packing. Cracking is pretty straightforward. You can see it on this left image here, which is compact, which is labeled compact. This is adapted from a Washington Post um, article. Uh, compact, but unfair, right? We see that roughly 60% um, of the population is blue, 40% is red. But if you draw your districts where you, you cut off so that red is always a minority, you disperse voters across districts and they can never meet, meet a majority. Packing is sort of the opposite. Packing is when you take people who agree and you stuff them all into that, that one district. So sure, that district is like 100% red or 100% blue, but it's only one district. And if they were dispersed, uh, differently, they might end up being majorities in two or three or whatever districts. Stacking is the most subtle and kind of the most nefarious, but also the one that is the easiest to defeat with voter turnout. Uh, it's basically like put just incredibly bluntly. It's you bundle poor folks who you don't think are going to vote at high rates in with rich folks who do and it makes it look like it's one of those minority majority districts, like one of those um, districts that the Voting Rights Act requires, but in actuality, it's always gonna go to the like rich uh, ex-urban folks instead of, this is where you often see like, there'll be one uh, census block in a city and then the rest of the district will expand outwards off into um, much more rural areas. That's, that's often how you do that. Um, that one, uh, if you rely on stacking for your gerrymandering, if you have a really huge upswell in voting, um, it, can, it can cause, you know, like sort of what's called like sweeps or tides. Um, so those are 
the three techniques that people talk about, um, I'm happy to talk more about any one of them, um, but <coughs> TLDR, because there was a lot of text and I want to help you out here. So the courts right now say that uh, this is from that Rucho and Common Cause decision. Their basically result is racism is against American values, so racial gerrymandering is bad. And I put them for now there for a reason. Um, but then they say partisanship is part of being an American, so that's fine. So partisan, partisan gerrymandering is, is pretty cool. <clears throat> but in general, the rules right now for drawing districts you should have less than a 10% population deviation, and uh, you should be as geographically, po uh, geographically compact as possible. That's not actually really well defined. It's kind of an eyeball test, which you know it, it is not uncommon to get in um, Supreme Court decisions, perhaps most uh, famously, you know, I'll, I, what's pornography? I know it when I see it, right? Um, so that's the state of things. And I put that uh, racial gerrymandering is, uh, is still illegal for now because not only have certain requirements of the Voting Rights Act been um, overturned, additionally, if you read the 2015 Arizona State, for, I think it's Arizona Legislature versus Arizona uh, Districting Commission, there's some very clear language in there that's like, hey, you know, if you ask these questions in a certain way and come back to the court, we might consider them in a different light. Obviously, uh, given the events of last week, um, these put the stakes and context of what's going on in, a, in a, another and significant light. So that's sort of where we stand in very brief. My argument is maps are powerful, which is super cliche, right? Like if you've taken an intro, I don't know how many of you have ever taken an intro geography course, but if you take one, it's all like maps have meaning and stuff. Okay, but it's really, really foundationally true, right? Like this is a map again from um, Washington Post because I like to steal maps from them. They have nice uh, map this might be from the New York Times. Um, <clears throat> basically, wars are fought over maps. People draw borders, and then other people don't like those borders. And you know, they they and I'm not weighing in on any of these specific maps here, right? Because this is a, a touchy political subject. I'm just saying, like, these are maps that the drawing of the one on the left led pretty directly to the events on the right. And that's a significant moment. Or if you want something a little more amusing, the Google Maps War, which wasn't quite a war. Basically, in 2010, there is uh, this border between uh, Nicaragua and Costa Rica, which has been kind of in dispute since 1858, which is long before Google Maps. But uh, due to a sort of update on the map, uh, suddenly the disputed area was in Nicaragua instead of in Costa Rica, which was sort of where the international consensus was that it belonged. And noticing that, or at least stating that this is why, um, Nicaragua sent their troops in there and occupied it. And then obviously people were like, what? And um, the, the president, I believe, of Nicaragua at that time is just like, look at Google Maps. Obviously, this is our authority now for where um, boundaries are of the state, and we have every right to be here. Fortunately, um, there was you know, a big commotion and uh, things settled down without a war. But uh, that's um, you know, just an example of how a very simple, and in this case, private entity mapping software can update itself and cause very real material experiences on the ground of uh, signif uh, significance. Um, there's also, of course, you know, uh, there's that age old thing where if you're uh, in that 
it'll show itself as not part of China, but if you're in China, it'll show Tibet as part of it. Like where boundaries are drawn, Google's really smart now in, in a lot of facts, like not, you know, super smart, but in a lot of, uh, uh, because of this event, they're very careful and they'll actually use IP addresses to uh, draw a map boundaries of contested areas differently. Um, I'm <coughs> so that's that's fun. Uh, or the like the nine dash line where you know you are encouraged as a um, Chinese scholar to try to get maps with that line that shows their interpretation of the border in scientific publications. Uh, there's actually a stated sort of desire for that. Although I'm sure at least one audience member right now is going to call me on, on that. Um, just looking at the names in the audience. Um, so, you know, it's also just really simple. This is like, you know, this is from Cartography 101, right? And it's from Boston again. I'm from that area. Sorry. Um, on the left, we just have population counts. And you can see that, you know, one, uh, one area uh, circled in red, it, it doesn't look that dense, right? It, um, and then this other area looks like it's really dense. But if you actually switch them, you can see that uh, if you, you do population by acre, you actually normalize the data. So you're looking at density instead of a total count. You see, oh wow, actually like it, that is part of this dense urban core that you can't see in the left map at all. And you know, out over there, that's where I think um, Nobles and Carino is, which is like an incredibly wealthy uh, private high school. <coughs> Logan Airport stays about the same because nobody lives there except for those of us trapped. Um, so maps are how we make claims upon the world. For good and for ill, for justice and not, right? We use these maps to kind of stake claims of legitimacy on things. And it can be banal everyday stuff, like where can you put that fence? Are you actually encroaching on your neighbor's lawn when you, when you want to, you know, make that new fence so your dogs can run around? But it's also like, you know, generic stuff, like what country do you live in? Those aren't fixed over time. And the idea that they are is, or, or that they're natural is, is just really flawed. Or, you know, again, for the everyday, like some towns, have, some cities have higher tax rates than others. Uh, if suddenly, you know, you're on the border between something and that shifts over a hundred feet, you could be in a different um, tax zone. So how we and what we map matters. And neither of these are actually given. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rely on other Jim. I'm going to ask the audience, uh, does anybody know what this map is? Just recognize it offhand. Uh, somebody asked, uh, is it a cholera map? You got it. That person wins Of the London, I believe. It is the, this is the famous James Snow cholera map, not the one from Game of Thrones. Sarah uh, knows her stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> What this actually did, though, and or what I want to um, suggest or call your attention to is, so for those of you that don't know what it is, what you can see if you look closely is there's some circular brown dots that are pumps. They're water pumps where people could get their water. And where the black lines are basically how many people died of cholera in the houses that lived there. And and what you see here is like, oh, wow, look, a lot of people died around this uh, pump right in the middle of the city. Maybe this is actually an environmental problem, in, in, which it was, you know, this, this well, this water pump is infected. And, and you can see sort of, or, or what they found was that, you know, the pumps closest to the places that had lots of deaths were the wells that were infected with cholera. It's an incredibly early example of just taking data, mapping it spatially, and using that to find out or make a claim about the world. In this case, to very, very specifically 
make a claim that shifted what was being viewed as a personal problem into a sort of environmental one. Now I want you to take a look at this, which is from the 1960s. It, is, it has a very um, aggressive title, uh, which is intentional. This is from uh, the, I want to say it's the first Detroit Geogra Geographical Expedition and Institute, but it might be the second. And what they mapped here was where rats were, where people who took their children in for getting bitten by rats, uh, where they lived. And then they mapped over it where there were frequent rat sightings. And what you can see again, because up until that point, the argument was like, well, your kids are getting bit by rats because like you're a terrible parent and you live in filth and like it's all your fault. But again, what you see is that this is an environmental problem. This isn't an individual problem. This is something where you can, um, you can address it on a societal level. You can take this map as they did to the, gover the, the local governments and you can get them to send in rat catchers. And that's, that's sort of an illustration of how we can use maps. But that also means that all districts are gerrymandered. What? I know that's a bit of a leap, but what I'm trying to show you is that the lines on the maps that we draw, they're not natural, they're not inevitable. They're ones that we decide upon. And so we need to think about how we draw those lines and why we draw them and the ways that we draw them. So one way you could draw them is time, distance, in Ohio, which is also the name of my new post-emo grindcore band. These are my band members. Alternatively, these are the participants of my NSFREU site, which researches gerrymandering. On the top, you might be able to see John Cena. Do understand if you can't see him. That's a joke for the three wrestling fans in the audience. So what we did, this is a research lab that I run on the summer. And so what we did is we looked at Ohio, which again is according to the ACLU, obviously unconstitutionally gerrymandered. They have a bunch of research on it and what have you. Um, but it's also at least so far only been shown to be partisan gerrymandered, which again, YOLO, sorry, Justice Kennedy retired, Gorsuch doesn't care. Um, it's not justiciable anymore. Uh, lar the other reason we chose the Ohio is that there's large amounts of reliable data available to the public. It has a large size and population. It has both rural and urban areas, and it has a history of alleged gerrymandering. And what we were going to do is we were going to um, we were going to take some uh, machine learning techniques and some census data and see, you know, what if we didn't, if we drew our lines using sort of just algorithms, which again are never neutral, so don't worry about that. But if we just looked at um, these districts and how, and how they're drawn, what might happen if we just, if we look at what are the closest units to each other? What are the easiest areas to travel between? So basically from the point that you're in, what are all the places around you that are the easiest to get to? And um, this is where I, I really wanted to be able to draw things for you. But, you know, if you're on one side of a river and somebody else is on the other side of the river, you might only be 100 meters apart. But if there's not a bridge, you're, you're not going to, unless you really like swimming uh, or have a vote, a boat, um, you're not going to just get there instantly. You don't, you don't teleport. If I want to get outside, I don't just, I'm five feet from outside, but I don't dive through my window. I go out and use a door. Um, the ways we move through space matter. So we decided to look at that because Ohio has things like this is allegedly the most gerrymandered, one of the most gerrymandered districts in the nation. This is called, a lot of these gerrymandered districts get uh, cute names. Like there's Goofy kicking Pluto or Donald Duck kicking Pluto. I forget who, you know, some Disney characters 
committing violence on each other. But this is the snake on the lake because it looks like a snake and it's on a lake. It's very creative. And so we looked at travel time again because Euclidean distance, people don't move how the crow flies. Um, and also communities tend to be centered around what's near you. I know in the times of COVID, this is changing, um, where we all are having Zooms and, and what have you, but this very event was centered around the Swiss, right? So we weren't, um, as, uh, as Jim uh, pointed out, COVID allows us to invite whoever we want, but uh, before that, we were kind of limited to people that could actually show up to the Swiss on that date at that time. And mapping time's really hard. Here's another one for the, uh, the chat. Anybody know what this is? It's a Menard, is the cartographer. I'll give that as a hint. Uh, Nanette says it's Napoleon's March on Russia. She's got it. It is. And so if you're looking, if you look sort of left to right, the kind of beige color is the march there to Moscow, and the black color is the march back. And if you look at the bottom, it has the temperature. And so you can see the temperature dropping. And um, obviously people, uh, the, as the line gets thinner, that means the army is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. This is a very, very early, very, very famous attempt to show time on a map because it's really hard. Uh-oh, I was looking at that. Ah, uh, so here, this is Seattle. And on the, this is again uh, from the work of Bill Bungie. Um, on the left, we have um, how far you can get basically from central uh, Seattle in increments of minutes. So 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and so on. And then on the right, what we have is they've distended and distorted the actual physical underlying map, what we think of as the sort of base layer, to make the actual travel times into circles. Um, I think I included this slide. Yes, here is another example of that. Here is a hiker hiking along the ridge of a swamp. Both of the, uh, and this map is from the Nuclear War Atlas, which is a, a brilliant, a brilliant book. Um, it shows the uh, hiker along the ridge of a swamp. And what you can see, if you look at that part that kind of distends down, if you look at point A is where they are, uh, E and F and D and C are pretty easy to travel. But if you want to head actually into like the center of the muck of the swamp, which is B, on the, if you're looking at it from the overhead, it doesn't actually, which is the lower image, like the lower image is a satellite image. If you look uh, at that lower image, B is just as far away as uh, D or E. But if you actually consider like wading through a swamp versus like walking along its ridge, one is much faster, right? It's easier to travel. So what we're seeing here is ways that we can distend and bend and consider our spaces in ways that aren't just like, you know, this is one mile from this mile. This is one, I, I am six blocks from um, Peaks and Pints because I'm up in Proctor. I think I'm eight blocks, but I, I apologize for being off. Um, <clears throat> this is instead like, you know, it takes me 15 minutes to walk there versus it takes me five minutes to drive there versus whatever. So we use the thing called multi-dimensional scaling which what this does, it's a, it's a dimension reduction technique, technically, but it, it, it's sort of a lot more than that in other ways. It um, rearranges points into their own space according to a given metric. So what we fed in, what we did, and you see this in that upper left image right there, that is the centroid of every census block group in Ohio, and there's 9,000 of them. And what we did is we, we calculated the travel time between each point and every other point in Ohio. 
we used uh, OSRM, which is an open source routing machine. Um, we tested it against uh, proprietary travel time estimators. It came out fine. Um, we, we did it by car ta travel time, which I think is a big limitation, right? Because what if people don't have access to a car? What about bus routes and things like that? This was a first pass. Um, it ended up, so there's like 81, 83 million um, separate calculations there. You feed it into your MDS and you, at, and you ask it to sort of reshape the map so that areas that are easy to travel between are pulled together and areas that are hard to travel between are pushed apart. And that brings us to that bottom image. That's rotated 90 degrees, but that's the snake on the lake. And what you actually see if you compare travel time is that most points in the snake on the lake are actually much closer together than they look. If you just, if you just look at the satellite imagery, you go, wow, that's super gerrymandered. But if you consider how people move across that district, it's actually much closer together. And that's because there's a major road that actually runs along that district along which most of the population lives. This is not me suggesting the snake on the lake is not gerrymandered. It's me suggesting there's more going on there. In fact, if you then look at uh, kind of, you can do an inlier outlier test. Outliers are just sort of, it's a way to kind of statistically say, this is like, you know, most of the data is here, or this data is over there. So if you look at the areas that are the hardest to travel to and from in, uh, in terms of the rest of the district, the entire rest of the district, what you find is that those outliers are, I don't wanna say significantly because we haven't run the statistical significance test on it yet, but they are noticeably more white than the inliers, which returns us to that idea of stacking, where you subtly try to group certain groups that you expect to vote at higher rates in with other groups that you expect to vote at lower as a means of passing the jingles test but actually, Gingles test, I think, but actually racially gerrymandering. And so that's one of the really interesting results here. One of the results that we could only get at using a lot of heavy computation, basically. Um, for which I should thank Microsoft, which gave us Azure credits so that we could afford doing this. Um, credit where credit is due. So the next thing we tried to do and what I want to show you is we tried to actually say, okay, what happens if we just use a k-means on our MDS? I'll explain what that means. Let's start from the centers. Let's start from the centers of our existing districts, 16 districts, that's Ohio, 16 congressional districts. And uh, let's just say everything that is closest, everything that is more close to this center than it is to any other center, gets grouped here. So these are your districts if according to travel time uh, these are the easiest places to get. So everywhere in green basically it is easier for them to get to the the population center of that than it is for them to get to the population center of any other of the colors. It, it looks nice right like if I were if I were eyeball testing these districts I'd be like yeah that's that's reasonable, but they, the populations don't work at all. <laughs> they don't, they're, they're like 50% off at times. So then we started trying a process of fixing the contiguity where you start swapping things in and out and it becomes a lot uglier, but you keep working and you get something like this. This is a map of 16 districts in Ohio where based on best accuracy of population, so under 10% deviation, every one of these districts is relatively easier to get to the, the, the population center of that district than it is to get to any of the others. Here is that overlaid with the 16 existing districts. 
And you can immediately see that the, the existing districts sort of break up areas of travel where it's very sort of obvious that some areas are easier to get to and some areas, like if you look in that center here, that sort of pink part that's added on to that kind of beige part, that's, some, that's likely some stacking. So the next step is to really dive into this and spend some time seeing if this approach can reveal to us uh, racial gerrymandering, which is still justiciable for now that we couldn't see just by looking at a top-down map because uh, you wouldn't understand, uh, or not understand, you wouldn't be able to see the, the travel times. So you think this doesn't matter, and I'll end with Washington. Does anybody know that way, way, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm sorry. In 1972, the Washington legislat uh, legislature could not agree on a districting plan. So the court appointed a special master, which by the way, is a rad term. And I think we should all strive to be appointed special masters at some time in our lives. And that special master was no, none other than University of Washington professor, Richard Morrill, <coughs> uh, an absolutely brilliant um, scholar who retired uh, a few years ago, I believe. And he drew them. But then in 1976, he actually decided, you know what? I want to see what the districts would look like according to travel time. And he used a couple of algorithms, which I've been un unable to recover because they, are, they were published in this obscure journal that I just can't get a hold of. And it was the 70s. Um, so I can't fully recreate this process. But he actually wanted to see how does my map stack up against uh, the, if, we, if we consider travel time as the basis for, for districting? And there, there's a number of reasons for do that, to do that that date all the way back to, you know, I think it was not Thomas Jefferson, it was maybe like James Adams was, talked about like districts should be where you could travel by a horse in a day and, and crap like that. Um, so, the very start of this project is I had a grad student in uh, University of Washington Tacoma's wonderful MSGT program uh, look at how, and this is actually an earlier approach than what we did uh, in Ohio, but look at some of the districts in Washington. And this is the district in which uh, we, probably many of us find ourselves, I don't know where everybody is. And you can see, here's the shape on the map on the right. And, and, and if you run it through an MDS on travel time, it becomes this giant circle with spokes coming off of it. And now anyone that doesn't know the geography of the region might wonder why it becomes that. The reason is because that's Olympic National Park and people don't tend to live there or travel through it. If you're trying to get through one side of Olympic National Park to the other, you don't sort of drive through the center or up the mountain and over. You take wherever the routes go. And so this is, so again, this, this is just to sort of bring it home to Washington and show that we can consider the spatial, the spatial and temporal relations between where we live and how we vote, not only in far off distances, but also where we are today. And there's a long history dating back to the 70s and where our uh, sort of the basis of our current legislative plans originated in doing so. So I've talked for a long time, I think. I, I, I don't have my presenter view up, so I can't tell how long I've gone. But if you take nothing else away, here are my, my key takeaways. Lines on a map are powerful markers of inclusion and exclusion. And there's no austerely fair or correct line. And anybody who tells you that their line is just objectively correct, you should question. Instead, we need to work towards understanding how these lines are drawn and why they're drawn. And the purpose for that is so that we can draw and live in the lines that we want. So I thank you all for your time. Uh, if I've missed something or misspoken in some ways, I apologize. Um, I really enjoyed this and I'm happy to take questions. All right, let's hear it uh, virtually for our speaker. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, 
So, uh, Jim's going to take a short break uh, while we give away some freebies. Uh, so, for a pair of the absolutely fabulous uh, Think and Drink socks, um, the how you're going to give away the first one is, uh, and get your chat ready, so you're going to chat uh, to, it's going to come to Jim or me, it doesn't really matter, sorry, to Jim, it's a bad case of the Jims today. Um, so, uh, I want you to chat, where did Tom Brady go after he left New England? That is your question. Where did Tom Brady go? Oh, Nanette Huber is right on it with the Buccaneers. Nicely done. So Nanette gets a pair of socks. So Nanette, so we're, uh, we're going to have another winner here in just a second. But uh, to get your prize, uh, what you want to do is send me in the chat since nobody else can see it but me. Uh, send me your uh, mailing address and whether you want small or medium slash large, because for some reason that's the two sizes we have. I don't know why they just kind of uh, compiled everybody in medium and large together. So it's either small or medium or large. Let me know your address, mailing address, and uh, which size you would like, and I will get it to you. Anon. All right, the second one, so it's not football trivia uh, night. Uh, we will go with, uh, I want everybody to pick a number between one and 30, one and 30. Everybody's on it. Let's see, I haven't seen my number go pi, nice nerd. Let's see. I don't think I've seen my number come up yet. Well, I think the closest person I see is Fatima, and I'm, I apologize if I'm uh, butchering your name, Fatima Eddy. Uh, you actually got 20, the number was 21. Uh, which is not only, so temp, September 21st is not only my anniversary, it was also uh, a great song by um, Earth, Wind & Fire. So if you want to really get something stuck in your head, go look up um, the 21st of September and find that Earth, Wind & Fire song and you will be amazed at um, how that plays out. Plus the video that you will see uh, from that era is just amazing and psychedelic. So. Uh, so, Fatima, if you want to send me your info as well and what size you would like, um, I will um, get something to you as well. So, thank you all um, for playing for the freebies, and now it's time for question and answer. So, I did see a question that came up before we got to that. So, the first question for Jim is, have you ever thought about what redrawing state boundaries might look like to better balance senatorial power? Um, not in a like, I'm going, so I, I should separate two sort of things as I answer here. One is the kind of like, I'm a computational social scientist and I've looked at these things and I can sort of stake my expertise on these claims. And the other is, here's some stuff I've thought about. And so the answer to that one is not in a kind of real rigorous sense. I think that there are some people that have done um, really good work with that. Um, Andy Shears put out a map a few years ago uh, suggesting it. Um, Garrett Dash Nelson, who uh, it was associated with this research pro uh, project and is, is a dear friend, both those guys are, are dear friends actually. Um, you might be familiar with him from doing the mega regions of the US maps where he sort of looked at like where are the relations in work uh, uh, within the US and how might we form electoral districts based on that. Um, uh, but other than that and other than just being like, man, wouldn't that be neat? <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't really given it uh, much thought. There are some uh, historians who claim and these are a minority of, of, of folks, but um, there are some people that claim that the reason there are two Dakotas is because they expected that uh, both would be um, Republican at the time of founding and they wanted to kind of increase their control of the Senate. There are more historians that say that that is not true and it actually has to do with historic trade routes, but um, 
just so you know, like, you know, it's not a, making more states and redrawing state boundaries is not a, a new idea. It's, it's something that I think has always been fought over. But yes, yeah, certainly that could be done. Um, I have not uh, done it. It wouldn't be that hard even. You take population by county and then you just do a K-means. I was wondering, because I, I think that that would be, um, I would like to see what the, what it would look like to have Cascadia um, as a, an actual state, um, as um, many of us know about. So um, yeah, I, I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that if you look at if you look at Garrett's um, mega regions, I might be able to pull it up really fast. Um, sorry for my mechanical keyboard. Anyone who shared an office with me knows that I type loud. I apologize. Um, yes. Okay. I can pull this up. Um, open image and new tab, so that you don't see that I have eight hundred tabs open and. I mean, we all do, but we like pretend that we don't. <laughs> okay, so this is Garrett's uh, looking at mega regions where these are sort of, these are spaces that emerge in terms of uh, work ties using uh, what's called loads data, which is census data about sort of where people live versus where they work. And you can see that actually a kind of Cascadia does emerge, but it's sort of two. One is Portland and one is Seattle. Mm -hmm. So, you know, two, uh, I guess, anarchist districts, but uh, <laughs> jurisdictions, my, my apologies. But yeah, you, you can see these sort of emerge. And I do recommend, uh, Garrett's work is really great um, if you want to look at that. Uh, but that's, you know, something you can look at. Thank you. By the way, that last question was from Mary. So this one is from E.R. Alvarez uh, wants to know, have you done any research on gerrymandering between or within school districts? That's a great question. And uh, if you're super interested in that, um, I recommend the Groffman, the final Groffman report, which was for a court case in Utah. And if you email me, uh, I'll, I'll send it to you. Like I have it and I'd, I'd love more people to talk with about it. Um, but Groffman was looking at gerrymandering in school districts with respect specifically to the Navajo Nation. And Groffman is in many ways just one of the like absolute just brilliant scholars of electoral districting. There's, there's really no way to put it other than that. Um, and, and he wrote the report, the court responded to it, and then he responded to the court and, and won and got a more just districting for the Navajo people in, in Utah, at least at that time. I, it, this happened in 2015. Um, I haven't you know kept up on it. But yeah, so school districts are a really great one. Um, and my colleague from Microsoft uh, has, done, has done some work on that, particularly in, in Nevada and Utah. Um, I individually uh, have not, and um, there's also uh, shoot. There's also some interesting work on um, other Jim might like this on uh, water watersheds as uh, for districting. So, like mm -hmm. you look at kind of like, and particularly because in the east you'll have these kind of they're like quasi political. They're not like states or towns, but they're like water bureaus and you'll have those. And so there's been talk about using those to kind of form communities. Uh, there's a whole other, um, so the, the stuff I showed you guys uh, in Ohio, that was the work we did last summer um, with the students in person. This summer we, we did a remote sort of research lab with a fewer students to kind of trial it out um, and we looked at uh, Charlottesville, actually, and we were looking for communities of interest, which are 22, this is more my, I am fortunate enough that the co-PI on this grant with me is my spouse, and uh, she's a, a mathematician, so when I run into math trouble, I can just turn to her. Um, but uh, she was looking at uh, ways to try and detect communities of interest in census data because I believe it's 22 states require communities of interest to be respected in, uh, in districting, but only like 12 or 13 define what a community of interest is, and they're all different. <laughs> um, 
so uh, so that's been something that, that she she's been looking at uh, using what's called the mapper algorithm, which is a algorithm from algebraic topology, which isn't a long winded way to not answer your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, Leanne and Patrick want to know, um, has MDS, your modeling, been used at all in arguments in courts or been successful? Uh, I am in a conversation with someone in Idaho for it to be used, but it has not yet. So uh, this was pre-COVID. Um, I was out at Gonzaga Law, uh, giving you know, a talk on this. And... Um, someone uh, looking at some stuff in the Idaho Supreme Court wanted to use it, but then um, COVID happened and I, I'm not sure, like I would assume it hasn't happened yet because I haven't heard from them in a while. Um, but, but so to understand um, my research angle in this and, and in some ways to contrast it with the MGG group who are, like Mundishin is a great scholar in this. These are the people out of Tufts that wrote the efficiency gap stuff that was like, that met Kennedy's demands. Um, they very specifically went after this as a means of sort of coming at uh, court cases and, and being useful in court cases. And so um, what, I, what I run is called uh, Research Experience for Undergraduates. And uh, it's, a it's intent is a little different. Like we're doing good research but my actual goals are to train that kind of next generation of scholars and activists to be able to go out, excuse me, and um, make claims and make arguments and address these things to give to give young people the tools they need to be able to um, like you know battle this however they want, honestly. Um, because I would like to point out that uh, gerrymandering occurs from both the left and the right. Uh, it's just the right's been in the last 20 years way, way better at it. Um, and that, that's just true. That's not me saying that, you know, morally one side is right or wrong. Um, it's just one side better. And uh, so if my work never gets used in a court case, my work directly, I'd be okay with it. But if like my students go out and end up in these court cases, and some of them now are in law school and stuff like that, that that's my intention and that's actually the the sort of goal of the funding that I've received but also uh, I have been in conversation with a case in Idaho but um, I COVID has you know COVID is COVID COVIDed us all for lack of a better verb gotcha um we have I Tim Gould asks, uh, does using topographical features to draw political boundaries make sense given the way that the features can affect people's travel and time to reach places of given distances? Yes, that's an easy one. <laughs> well, if you, want, if you want to consider uh, people's ability to get to places as something that is uh, valid or um, interesting or important in districting, then yes, absolutely. And so what we've done um, and our, our approach is really just using like route networks. So it, it factors in that travel time, which is why you saw Olympic National Park just emerge in that, in that Washington map like immediately. Um, I would argue, yes, it does make sense because I, and, and one of the things that um, in the Groffman, to circle back to Groffman in the um, complaints of the Navajo um, <coughs> nation was that their only polling place was like three and a half hours away. Like it looked on a map, like it was, it was pretty close, but it was because you had to circle around a mountain to get there. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I think that uh, uh, using travel time, using topographic features, considering how people actually move through, inhabit, and live in space is fundamentally important in understanding how we draw districts. Because, you know, I, I, as I said in the talk, like you could be a hundred yards from me as the crow flies, but if there's a river between us and no bridge, I, I can't get to you. I mean, I guess I could get, I could swim, but then I'd be all wet. 
<laughs> All right, uh, John Barty asks, it seems like travel time is used as an indicator of community. If true, then could you talk a bit about the underlying importance of, or assumptions about the importance of community to districts? Yeah, so that, um, I kind of got into that a bit when I mentioned communities of interest uh, a second ago. That's a really great question. I don't want to argue that uh, travel time can be a stand-in for ways of defining community because it, it, it can't. But I would suggest that when we're talking about um, kind of electoral interests, right? The people that are, if, if you're going to draw them in a geographic contiguous manner, which is required right now, you can't have non-contiguous districts unless you know like there's a water and stuff like that. Um, but if you're going to uh, draw contiguous districts, um, then suggesting that districts are easy to get to ha uh, should be spaces that are easy to get to makes a bit of sense. Um, I don't think it, it stands in for community and I think there's been some really good work from, from that Tufts group showing sort of how you can and can't draw majority minority districts um, that, that follow certain rules because they were, they were looking at the, there's a C-shaped district in, in Chicago. Um, <coughs> that's, but so one of the other sort of uh, approaches of this project is to use a different kind of, um, to, look, to look for communities of interest. So basically to look for communities of interest that the federal state could be allowed to see. By which I mean, right, like the, the federal state doesn't get to look at, well, shouldn't get to look at like your cell phone data and decide, you know, that you visited Facebook 10 times yesterday. So you must like X, Y, or Z, right? You're, or see that you, you know, you streamed, um, I don't know any popular bands. Uh, you streamed a popular band on, 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 on uh, YouTube and somebody else did as well, so you're now you're now linked together. But what they do get to look at is the census. Census data is super important. Everybody, if you haven't completed your census, please complete your census. Um, and uh, so we were looking at, can you just look at trends in uh, census data, and that's it. And will sort of clusters emerge of people that share a bunch of characteristics according to census data. And that's sort of one of, that's not perfect either because like, just because you know, you're the same age as me, make the same amount as me and like whatever, you know, have the same uh, ethnicity according to the census as me, doesn't mean we actually get along at all or, or share much in interest. Um, but it is, you know, we're delimited in terms of the types of data that we can look at for these things to, um, certain, you know, certain sets of variables. And that's where uh, gerrymandering can be really nefarious. So like red map, which I, you might have, you might have heard of, that was the very specifically uh, Republican created GIS that was meant to um, help them, uh, uh, that group, draw districts, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to do us versus them to, to help that group draw districts um, that would favor their interests. And, and again, I, I want to point out that, that that 2019 case was one Republican gerrymandering, one Democratic gerrymandering. This isn't a one side. This isn't these guys do it. These guys don't. Uh, it's just one side's been way better at it. Uh, and so red map was the way they did it. And that had all sorts of data in it. It had your financial records if they had them. It had, you know, um, church uh, church stuff. And, and then, so they could draw districts based on that. And then when they got to court, the court could only analyze them based on census data. And so if I have a bunch of data that you can't see, that makes it easier for me to draw lines that you can't know why I'm drawing. Um, and, and, and again, you know, uh, Tim Kaine, 2016 VP candidate, I believe at one point called himself the like 
king of gerrymandering. This isn't like a, a this isn't an us for them. This is just a we need to consider how these lines are drawn and why. So I, to loop all the way back, and I do apologize, I'm finishing my second beer, so things are getting a little uh, <laughs> convoluted. To, to, I don't think that travel time is a stand-in for community. I don't think that census data is a stand-in for community. I do think that if we are limited to certain sets of data that we can use, then we need to do our best with those data to try to understand models of community that might make sense. All right, uh, there's a few more questions, but I think we're gonna end it at this point. It's dark. I don't know if anybody under, uh, uh, figured out that it actually fall fell uh, today. So it is now dark at 7.30 uh, p.m., which really sucks. Uh, was really like in the 10, 10 o'clock, uh, there's still a little bit of light in the sky. You don't have small children. Uh, yeah. 10 p.m. Uh, light is hell on bedtime. <laughs> Um, so I appreciate uh, all of the questions and for you all chiming in tonight. Um, I will actually um, send some other questions just for thought for Jim that we have. He can actually see these in the chat. Yep. I think there's a couple others that might and be of interest to cover in some other uh, talk. But Also do uh, email me. I'm not great at email right now because again, COVID has COVIDed us all. But I will, I love when people want to ask questions and I will try to answer them. I, you know. Do you want to put your uh, email in the chat? Yes, room? I'll put it in the chat. Cool. All right. Uh, while he does that, let's give one last thanks to our uh, awesome speaker. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, and uh, thank you all for chiming in. Hopefully we will see you all uh, October 13th as our next Think and Drink. Come see Shannon Seidel talk about uh, education in STEM uh, areas and uh, we have lots of other cool talks coming up this year and again if you have any ideas uh, besides I think I, I put a question out to Luke uh, you might have to hit him up for us Jim oh, uh, I'll hit him up he had to leave for dinner yep. he's, he's, he's smart <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Hit him up. Uh, but if you have any other ideas, uh, you can email me at jimgal at uw.edu. Um, you can find that through the Think and Drink pages. Um, and I'd be happy to hear your ideas for talks next year. Uh, otherwise, you guys have an excellent evening. Uh, enjoy and uh, be well. And we'll talk to you all soon. Take care, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Have a great night, all of you. Thanks, Jim. That was awesome.